Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. Today's guest is Johnny Wolf, and he has been on our podcast more than a year before. So, of course, I wanted to have him back and talk about the current market because it's uh, there has been a lot of change. As you guys know, the interest rate went from 4% to all the way to like, at le- and I'm talking about for investment properties and went all the way to 9%, 10% right now. So, uh, Johnny works on pretty interesting idea. Um, he ha- he got a horrible Craigslist roommate experience, which led him to think outside the box, and he converted a single family home to a group home for his friends and realized the potential in multi-tenant real estate investing. Johnny loves to share how his startup home room exploded despite the global pandemic, raising six million dollars to date. So, welcome, Johnny. Hey, Alpesh, so glad to be back. Um, I very vividly remember our last conversation, and I'm excited to kind of share updates with you and hear how you're doing. That's awesome. So tell us something interesting or funny about yourself. Um, yeah, my first word was cheese as a baby. So that's something ah, interesting about okay. me. And I still, um, cheese is sort of my favorite thing these days too. So it's like I've been a consistent life theme for me, really, <laughs> on the culinary side. Yeah. And what was your very first investment and how did it work out for you? Yeah, my very first investment was um, in Midland, Texas. It was a new build. Um, I bought it in 2008 for $95,000 with a 10% wow. down loan. New build. Yeah, it worked, <laughs> yeah, it worked out for 95 grand. It worked out well. You know, never really cash flowed much. Um, it was sort of before I really understood real estate investing. Um, but you know, it appreciated pretty well. And so I, you know, used some of the money when I sold that property to start homeroom. That's great. And I want to talk about, of course, the real estate investing in current environment. But what what are you doing? How because I heard and I read about your bio as well that you guys are looking at a lot of data science. So how can data science play a role in real estate investing? Yeah, uh, you know, uh Real estate is really a financial modeling exercise, really, a, you know, it's forecasting, it's looking at larger data sets, watching trends. And so um, my co-founder, Mike, you know, he worked at Airbnb and Facebook and in data science. And so we we use kind of his skill set and we built a, a little team around him to analyze different markets. We think the market is really the number one way you select real estate. You need to pick the market you want first. And there's some key indicators in which markets are going to do better than others right over the next few years um, in terms of appreciation and in terms of rent growth. Both of those are obviously educated guesses, but, um, you know, that's it's better to make an educated guess than a blind decision. So that's one of the big, big areas we do that. We additionally are going to be looking at we use our data science arm to uh, forecast rent prices by the room, which is what homeroom does is renting out homes by the room. And so you need the data science to kind of look at that. We have, we scrape uh, various websites to create kind of our data set. And then we forecast room rents over time based on uh, housing affordability, based on people living with roommates, accelerating all those things. Got it. And, and w- when you mentioned data science, what kind of data sets are you looking at? Um. Yeah, so it depends. There's two different main ones we're focused on. One is the markets and house selection, market and house selection, right? So that's based mainly on economic drivers. Uh, main, we you know we buy some data for that. Um, we also use publicly available data for forecasting population growth, income growth are two of the big ones. And then there's other things we're going to look at in terms of local proximity to different um, things for that home. Um, on the roommate side. And the room price side, we've figured out a way to scrape millions of data records for room pricing throughout the entire country so that we can use that triangulate which what's the room rent in this house is going to be for this form factor of room. It's pretty tricky, but um, we've been working on it for a long time. We've gotten much better than, you know, over time to, to be able to forecast that because you've got to pick the right house, but then you also have to forecast rent 
And on the room side, that that does take a little bit more um, data analysis than for a standard single family home, right? That the single family home rental rate is pretty universally available. The the room rate is something that you actually have to triangulate to. So that's that. Those are the two areas we use it. Got it. And um, especially in this market, right? Um, things have changed. What are the key things to think about when buying your first rental right now? Yeah, the you know your first rental right now. I think it's still the playbook is still pretty similar to me um, in terms of buying. Uh, I, I always recommend house hacking if you can buy in your local market, depending on the market that you're in. If you are, you know, if you're early in your career, I think buying that first house using hack house, uh, ha house hacking, which essentially is you buy a home, you rent out all the rooms, is how I got my start. I still think that delivers disproportionate returns for anyone is being able to do that it's a good foray into property management it's a good foray into learning you know how to buy a home um generally especially if you're early in your career and have limited capital good to do it with a home that's not going to require a ton of repairs so you can just avoid those big repair costs if you're cash uh you're you don't have a lot of cash um if you're buying your first rental and you have a lot of cash um, you know, I think it's a good time to look at high yield markets, right? I think those markets look especially appealing right now, markets like Kansas City, Indianapolis, um, with prices surging. I think we're looking in a future where I think markets like Austin will make sense as those prices are coming down. So I think right now yield markets still work in some cases. And um, so that's where I'd be looking if you have capital to deploy. Got it. And uh, of course, you know, I wanted to talk about first rental, but how do you level up from one to many properties? And what are the keys to reaching a large scale portfolio? Yeah, I mean, real estate is all about patience and time. I think, you know, you, you de depending on your your ability to generate income and your ability to, to invest uh, outside of real estate and your ability to invest time, you can accelerate real estate quite a bit, right? If you're someone that can actually do your own flips and in, in your market, you can, you can move faster. If you're someone that is making, you know, 500,000 plus, you can generate cash faster to deploy. But I'd say if you're kind of neither of those two kind of outlier cases, you know, I, the way that I think about it is if you can generate some cash flow and then find appreciation, that's going to be sort of your fastest way to do that. So I, you want to get your cash flow positive on your portfolio. And then I, so that would be maybe house one and two for me. Um, and then house after that, if you now have positive cash flow, is start to go for cash flow neutral properties in markets you think can can appreciate quickly, right? Because in three to five years, if you get rapid appreciation, you can 1031 those appreciating assets into bigger assets, right? right. So I think that's really, it's really difficult to scale a $300 a month cash flow in Cincinnati, Ohio because the value of the home just creeps up incrementally, but you also don't want to go cash flow negative on your real estate, right? So I think you need some cash flow to set your basement. And then I think you want to go appreciation after that, which can then turn into something bigger later, right? You can turn it into a, you know apartments, you could turn it into a home portfolio. So there's a lot of options. If you can get appreciating assets that you can turn into, you know, four or five X the value later down the road through 1031. Got it. And what about out of state investing? Is it still better than investing locally? Yeah. I mean, it depends on where you, you live, right? If you yeah. live for where... me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It depends on where you live. I mean, there's building a real estate portfolio in, in the Bay Area like you live is gonna be really difficult. Right. right. Um, <laughs> so I think for some and a lot of investors that we talk to are from like California. Um out of state is probably your your best bet, right? If you could get cash flowing homes in California, that would be sweet, but you're probably gonna have to put so much down that, right? you know, so you're just not gonna be able to scale it very quickly. But yeah, I, I think, you know, if you're in California, I think layering on some cash flow yield markets and layering on some appreciating markets is the, the way to go for sure. Yeah, so uh, a couple of thoughts I have as well. I think it's very important to invest out of state, even if you are investing locally, right? That's my understanding because it's going to give you market diversification, 
right? It's very important. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and especially not in the market where you, you already have a primary home, right? You don't want to have two, three, five houses around you, right? In the same market, anything can happen, right? Jobs could move. So you definitely want to have some kind of, you know, diversification when, which would be like, if you are living in Austin, even you can invest in Dallas or Houston, right? Of course, you, you can continue to invest in Austin, but you can also have a little bit diversification, right? But my question about Bay Area, um, you brought, does homeroom operate in Bay Area and does it even make sense for homeroom? <laughs> Uh, we do not operate in in Bay Area or California now. Um, it, in terms of what you were saying about diversification, I think that's really important, right? We, you know, I'm someone that owns homes in multiple markets, exactly. multiple states, and um, what we're seeing is Austin, which has been like the core of my portfolio, is like actually <laughs> leading the the country in like uh, price decreasing right now. But it led the country for 20 years in yes. terms of appreciation, right? So like. I would say that real estate market, the, the cities is when you buy a home in a city, it's sort of like investing in a stock of the city, right? Got and, it. And I think, I kind of think, you know, Austin is sort of the, I don't know, what is the best stock to own, but it's, it, Apple. you know, it's, it, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's Apple, right? So, so, but you know, even Apple has dips, but yes. then there's other stocks that are a little bit, they spit off dividends and they're a little more boring and you don't get to tell your friends about them over drinks, you know, Kansas city or something like that. And, but they're just very stable. Like Kansas city didn't go down really much during yes. 2008. Like it went down like 5%, I think. Um, it hasn't really gone down lately, right? It's just like, yep. it's never going to, it's never going to appreciate through the roof. Okay. Not never, but it's much more rare because population growth is very, very low. Um, so yeah, I think the diversification sort of like your stock portfolio or your, your asset portfolio elsewhere is some rapid appreciating options. And then some safer, kind of more consistent options. I think that's the key, right? And you move stuff into higher risk, you move stuff into less risk based on mixing it. And, it, you know, your financial advisor is telling you that with stocks. I think it's a really good strategy with real estate as well. I, I agree. And that's again, same thing, right? Kind of income diversification, right? Yeah. Because you, you, some income you want now and some income you can wait for three, five, 10 years, right? So, yeah. yes. And it's, it also is very like um, dependent on you, right? And your income, if you're making a million at Facebook a year, then like maybe you don't need cash at all. And you just want to go all appreciation because you want to cash out for, you know, millions later. Um, or if you're someone that's like really needs the incremental few hundred dollars a month, then maybe, you know, something with yield makes more sense, just like investing in dividend stock. So it just really depends on your lifestyle, your stage of life and like what's the most valuable to you. I do think that appreciation is where real estate money is typically made, even though it's really a cash flow. It's been, it's talked about as a cash flow thing, but in single family homes, the appreciation is where you gain, you just gain crazy returns. Right. And so I do think thinking about that all the time is important um, because you, you can make six figures in a sale of a home if you get the right one. Right. And that's in five years. So it's, it's, a, that's pretty valuable. And, it's uniquely leveraged to help you do that. Right. Yeah. As long as you can afford to pay mortgage. So I, I always yes. mention that don't go with negative cash flow thinking appreciation will come in next three, five years. Because you none of us can predict the real estate cycle, right? We all everyone thought that 2015 was end of the expansion, then 2019 was the end, it didn't happen. And then 2022 was the end and it still did not happen, right? So the real estate <laughs> cycle continues, right? So you, but you never know, right? So you always sure. want to at least make sure that you are, you know, have some kind of positive cash flow or at least breaking even uh, great, so that you can continue to cover the mortgage. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me, let me super clarify. Let me clarify my point there is like certainly cash flow neutral. But some of the time you should, you know, I think you can, with appreciation, it's much, rent prices don't deviate much, right? So that's pretty, your your cost and your cash flow is a lot more predictable. But I think you can somewhat predict appreciation over five to seven years if you're looking at some primary indicators of the city like population income growth. If those are surging, that's, you, that's, that's the basic you know, the real estate is a percentage of the economy, 
right? And so if income and population goes up, the economy gets bigger and then real estate gets their, their percentage, right? And that turns right. into prices of homes. So, but I would certainly agree with you. Do not go cash flow neutral. If you're making a million at Facebook, then maybe you can, right? But like, I think generally right. for most mortals like us, right. um, I think that um, cash flow neut neutral is where you want to be. But I do think you can put your chips on appreciation. You're just not going to know in seven or to seven years, I think you, you'll have a really good sense. Like if Austin right. continues to grow like this, you're going to be good, but maybe it'll go through a dip, right? You, we don't know that. Certainly right. don't. So. Yep. Agreed. So let's talk about co-living. How does co-living or rent by the room models work? Yeah. So we, um, we're one of the, there's a couple of co-living operators in the country. And we do things pretty similarly in the sense that we, um, We'll help investors find homes. Um, you know, our data science team will triangulate on the home, um, base pick, figure out the rent, and do a pro forma and underwrite those homes. Every day that for every home that hits the markets in the cities we're in, we actually do we'll underwrite each and every one, right? And then we'll surface the best deals to our investors um, and say, hey, is this an op? Is this a property that looks good for you? Before that, we're going to make sure people have the capital to invest, which is usually fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. We're also going to help them pick a market based on sort of what is the most interesting to them, right? Is it appreciation with neutral cash flow? Essentially, we do have Austin properties, and that's sort of the pitch there. And then we have, or is it as much cash flow as possible? It's like Kansas City or Indianapolis. Um, and so then we pick the market. We've then picked a home, and then they'll make an offer on the property with one of our partner agents and close on the home. And then we have... a. Uh, a team in each city that'll actually set up the home for co-living setting up a home for co-living is we'll furnish kind of the, the, the micro living room and we'll add kitchen essentials. And then in addition to that, we will, um, you know, set up, we will, uh, do construction. Typically we'll, we have a bunch, we have a couple, we have a few different products that we help our investors buy. We have a standard like five or six bedroom, no construction is needed on those homes. We also, we have something called our, Co-living plus will actually add bedrooms um, to the home to increase the rent and that'll add yield, right? And that's what's able to, you know, with co-living, you should expect 50 to 100% more yield for in the area that you're in. Um, and then we have actually, we'll do full burr renovations for investors who really want to maximize their um, their investment, right? So that's going to take more cash uh, than even the 100,000 but we'll essentially do an off-market deal and we'll flip it for them into a co-living home. So those are our three th three options and each one goes to the same cycle of selecting the market, selecting the home, and then our setup and rehab process. And which are the markets do you currently operate in? We operate in eight markets. Um, we operate in all the, the Texas markets. Um, we operate all the big Texas markets, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Atlanta, we're in Tampa and Charlotte. Got it. And how did you pick those markets? Uh, you know, I started in Austin. Uh, you know, that was that was where I started investing in 2015. Um, and uh, you know, the roommate demand in Austin is insatiable. Like, I don't, I, I don't know how many rooms the the market could support, but a lot. Uh, then I moved to Kansas City in 2018 to do to buy another portfolio of homes to rent by the room. So those are the two markets that I personally analyzed and selected for myself. So those have been our kind of our anchor markets. The third one was Dallas. Um, the economy of Dallas is, I, I, you know, it's near the top of the country for me. So those are those are really those are our big three, uh, followed by Atlanta. We've got it. We generally listen to investors and we'll do analysis on markets if there's if someone's going to buy uh, multiple homes and then we open that market up for other investors. So that's typically how we make the selection of other markets. Got it. And uh, doesn't it make it difficult to manage these properties remotely? Um, we've always managed remotely. Um, we started in COVID. Basically, we had a few homes, but then COVID hit. And so we've had to manage remotely since really our company started. So it's kind of natural for us. We, um, some of our team members worked at other fully remote technology, property management companies, but yeah, all, all, um, yeah, all there's, there's some pretty cool technology that enables remote management to be very effective these days. 
interesting. And how uh, how are you hiring remote property managers and you know handyman and whatnot for your team? Yeah, we have a we have a vetted vendor list, um, and we 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 assign re reviews and ratings. So it, typically, in each market, we'll have a real estate agent, we'll have a, a construction team. And we'll have sort of handymen and other vendors for maintenance. And so we we have a pretty, uh, the team is very experienced at finding and vetting vendors for prices. We have a standard pricing list that is for every piece of maintenance on the planet. And then we'll make sure their prices are online. And then we'll vet them um, in, a number, in, in a pretty detailed interview. And then we actually, will, we rate all vendors performance based on each job. And if so, if so a vendor slips below uh, our performance metrics, we'll cut them and find a new one. So we're able to do that kind of an ongoing basis in every market. And so we have consistent vendor quality with good pricing. Got it. Now that that's great. And how do you, I'm going to ask you for your secret sauce. How do you identify properties that could, would have above average returns? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, I'm trying to narrow that down because we, we look across 17 kind of variables, but let's go with the bigger ones. We generally are looking for, I would say something, you know, a little bit on the edge of, there, there typically is an inflection point with, if you're looking at a city map of value of homes, where it's like you're on, you're just over a certain street and suddenly the home will come down in value. So we like, we really like, especially in cities that are expanding, being on the very edge of that expansion. Um, we find that as the expansion occurs, it increases the value of the home. So in Austin, that looks like parts of North uh, East Austin, parts of Fluigerville, parts of Round Rock. They're, the prices are moving, but they haven't really got to parity with the core metro yet, right? But we see over time that as the metro expands, which it is growing very rapidly, that those parts will become as valuable and as dense as the rest. Um other parts are looking at room rental pricing, right? And that's that's a bit more complicated than I can get to on this call, but we're looking across millions of data points to identify how much a room will rent for. And so that's kind of a unique thing that we are going to do is say, how much can this set of six rooms rent for based on the each room size? And then compare that to other homes that with similar analysis, right? So that that's one of the, it's a little bit hard to emulate, but we are always looking at what's the rent going to be versus the price of the home, will the home appreciate? So those are, those are the three things. Got it. No, that, that, that's great. So last question and very important question, we move to the next section of the podcast. Is now a good time to invest in real estate? Uh, you know, I think now is a good time to make sure that you're acquiring something that's cash flow. And I think more than ever, or cash flow, neutral cash flow. And I think the one, the one rule in real estate is that you're not going to do as good in the first couple, two to three years. And so getting that painful period, uh, uh, getting over that hump, I think is important. So typically the sooner you can start, the better, right? Because because the amortization schedule of your mortgage, you're starting to pay off more of your mortgage over time. The property is stabilizing. You have more data points. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it is if you can do that, right? I think the question is, is values, will they go up or down? I think Pretty much everyone will say when you're looking at stock timing, it's not good to time the market. It's good to continually deploy capital, right? And so I think I would say the same thing for real estate makes sense for some people, right? If it's your first home ever, um, and you can get cash flow, you're gonna it's gonna work out in the long term, and that's inevitable, right? So that's 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 what I'd say there. And then refinances will eventually increase your cash flow if we see rates come down. So I think that's that's what I'd say. If you're neutral or positive, you're gonna be in a good spot. And right. if it goes, if it takes a dip, then you can buy again, right? If it doesn't take a dip, you bought at the right time, right? So that's sort of how buying stock makes sense. And that's sort of how real estate makes sense. Yeah. Dollar cost averaging. Exactly. Exactly. It's a little harder in real estate because it's a yes. bigger investment. And yes. The question is, can you, can you, <laughs> can you, can you gather the capital to rebuy again quickly right. enough? So it's a different, it's a little, it's a different decision matrix for sure. But all if you if you are gathering enough capital to buy every two or three years, I think now is a great time to buy. If it's the only home you're going to be able to buy in the next seven years, you know I think then it's a decision for you to make, right? Because we right. what we don't know is, you know, the cycle has been hot. We've seen some pullbacks. Do we expect further pullbacks? We don't know. But I do know it's very difficult to time the market in real estate and in stocks because the second prices come down in real estate. 
and rates come down, the the comp- competitive environment for homes goes up a lot, right? Yes. So in a way, by being an anti-competitive, you're almost an anti-competitive advantage right now where you can you can aggressively buy, you can get seller paid credits at the purchase, and you can pick a home that is in pretty better shape. You can be a bit more selective because you're not competing as much. Um, you still are, but I think the second prices, if they do come down, interest rates do come down, we were seeing offer, you know, we were seeing 30 to 40 offers and some homes, right? So what happens then is you pay over market for the property and you have to come out of pocket, right? And so you're deploying 20 or 30 cash, right? And so yes. what that does to your numbers is not a good thing. No. So I think, I think there is some big advantage to buying against, and this doesn't really exist in stocks, right? There's some big advantage to buying when everyone else is not buying. Um, and you have to offset that with the possibility of a decline over time. And I think generally it makes sense as long as you're able to accumulate cash to acquire again in two to three years if it does go down, or you can buy again if it's going up again at that point. Got it. Are you ready for fire round? Yeah, man. Let's let's bring it on. Let's do it. Let's do it. Would you be changing business or investment strategy because of the current environment where inflation is still there and we continue to talk about recession? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, in the last the last question, I, you know, I talked a bit about that. I think the answer is yes. I think that would, you know, going being very sure that you're cash flow neutral, I think is a requirement today. Right. I think if it was 2018 in Austin, someone said, I'm going to go cash flow negative 500 bucks a month. I would say not super prudent, but if if that's what you want to do, I don't know if that'll, it'll, I think you'll actually still win. Today, I'd say make sure cash flow neutral no matter what. So. Got it. Favorite yeah. nonfiction book? It could be real estate investing, self-development, business. Um, Yeah, I think my, well, it changes all the time, but right. I, I really like Minds, Mindset by Carol Dweck. Oh, okay. Um, I have that book. I got to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really good. Um, you know, just it, it's on the theme of like seeing challenges as growth, right? It's, so it's it's an optimism book, but it's also just she kind of follows a lot of stories of people that improved, basically by saying like, you know, who you are is not fixed, and who you can become is sort of based on your understanding that you can change nearly everything about yourself. So that, I think it's it's pretty amazing. She's a Stanford psychology professor so it's pretty she's pretty sharp and yeah it's really encouraging i love reading that well, that's great any tool or website or app you recommend mm, we really like using uh vest map it's a tool for property valuation and kind of like demographic researching we like that that tool quite a bit um I think that's that would probably be the one that is not on everyone's radar that we're big fans of. Got it. Any advice for investors? I think, you know, generally, I think early in invest in your investor career, right? I think I would over index on learning, you know, and and, uh, and under index a little bit on on making money, right? I think I, my my first deal I did okay, but what what I really learned is like how how to manage real estate, how to work with a property manager, how to think about age of property and the different expenses. And so you'll read stuff and then you'll kind of, I think you'll generally tend towards being like, it'll be better for me. That's just sort of what kind of happens to investors, but the experience, it teaches you much, much better. So if someone was going to say, I'm going to wait two years to buy my first place, I would say, well, can you just get something that's cash flow neutral? That's not as expensive today, right? Because I think that experience and then you're also going to see all the challenges of real estate investing. So you can discover if it, you know, if that's, if that's, if you like it. Right. And I think that's really, really important for a first time investor. And, and the first one or two or three deals were not my best, right. It was my sixth deal and my eighth deal that just crushed. So you got to get that knowledge base and then you can have like really great outcomes. And so I think learning is, is crucially important early on. Got it. How do you give back? Um, you know, we, um, we get back every day, I think in a way, like, um, we have the rents for, to rent a property at homeroom is 40% less than apartment in the same neighborhood. So I think in a way, like the whole company at homeroom is on a mission 
you know, that's not, we don't talk about that with investors necessarily because, you know, they're looking for yield. But for us, that's how we give back. Um, we had, we recently had one of our tenants that lived with us for four years and she finally had saved up enough to buy her own home and moved out. So it was like the whole comp, the whole company, it was pretty we celebrated that we we're super excited for her and we sent her a uh, microwave like for a new home. So that's, that's, you know, it's the, the company in itself was built to do that. Got it. How can my listeners reach out to you? Yeah. Um, Johnny at live homeroom.com. And is my email. You can reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to talk about investing or rent by the room, which is sort of the part that I have the most experience in. Uh, you can also um, reach out to the company at livehomeroom.com uh, backslash invest. And you can talk to our team about how to purchase a home and property. Awesome. Thank you so much, Johnny, for your time today. Of course, Alvesh. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing!